when it comes to the information string in the DNA, the contention is basically that given enough time, you run the experiment enough times, and eventually you will end up with an evolution that and combined with natural selection, it preserves the mutations that are good, and you will end up with a something that looks designed even though it is not designed. That mutation over time being preserved by natural selection is enough. Why doesn't that work? It's, uh, there's a mathematical problem, and it's a profound one. Um, my colleague David Berlinski calls it the combinatorial problem, or the problem of combinatorial inflation. Um, maybe simple analogy, way to get into it. We know from our experience uh, with software code, writing and, and, um, and using it, that the last thing you want in a section of functional software code is a, random, a series of random changes to those zeros and ones. If that happens, you're going to degrade the information that's in that code long before you'll ever generate a new a software program or operating system. And um, Richard Dawkins and many, many other biologists have, have, have acknowledged that what we have in DNA is akin to machine code, or as Leroy Hood puts it, digital code. It's, the, it's functioning in exactly the same way. So what we've learned from software writing and using is highly relevant to understanding whether or not the mutation selection mechanism would actually generate, could generate conceivably or realistically new information. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a reason that changing software at random invariably degrades the information before you get anything useful and new. And that is because there's so many more ways to go wrong. In any, in any system of uh, digital or typographic or alphabetic communication, there are, there are vastly more ways of arranging the characters in question that will generate gibberish then there are ways of arranging those same characters that will generate something functional. So if you start randomly changing things, you're overwhelmingly more likely to find a gibberish se a sequence than a functional one. And as we've actually tried to quantify that, how much more likely, the, the quantitative odds are prohibitive. There's a scientist who worked for 14 years at, at Cambridge University, Douglas Axe. He did his PhD at Caltech, went on to do a long-term molecular biology research postdoc at, at, at Cambridge to try to quantify this question. How rare or common are the functional sequences that would make a new protein or uh, a, new, a, a new gene capable of making a new protein, how, how rare are the functional ones in comparison to the non-functional ones? And for a relatively short protein, about 150 amino acids long, he determined that the ratio of functional to non-functional sequences was about one over 10 to the 77th power. Now to put that in context, there are only 10 to the 65th atoms in the Milky Way galaxy. So what that means is that a random search for a new functional sequence is going to be like looking for one marked atom among 10 trillion, or uh, sorry, yeah, it'd be a t one trillion galaxies of the size of the Milky Way. So, uh, and what, what it turns out that even four billion years of life's history is not enough time to, to solve a search problem of that magnitude. And I go into all the math of this in the book and, and it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. There's only 10 to the 40th organisms in the history of the planet not enough replication events to search a space 10 to the 77 uh, big. So you're looking at, even in the whole, if you take the whole history of, of life on the planet into account, you're only going to be able to search a tiny, tiny fraction of the total relative, re relevant sequences. So you got a really big haystack, really small number of needles, and very little time to look for them. The bottom line is it's overwhelmingly more probable that such a, uh, a search will, will fail than succeed in the known time of life on planet Earth, which means that the, the mechanism is more likely to, the, the hypothesis that the mechanism produced new information is more likely to be false than true. And so the result of this is, as you say, that it's, it's more likely that it's, that it's designed than that it was randomly done in, in terms of DNA, and that's reflected in, in the fossil record, in the extent to the extent that there have to there, there's sort of these jumps in the fossil record, and this is what you talk about in Darwin's doubt, is that it's not a continuous process of a, of mutation upon mutation building one on the other just randomly. It becomes a big engineering problem because it's not just that there's gaps in the fossil record. You have to ask, well, how would the evolutionary process produce all the new information necessary to build these completely new body plans, new cell types, new anatomical structures? And we know it, it would take a lot of new information. And so then you've got to look, well, um, is there enough time to do that? Uh, do you have enough trials uh, through this mechanism? And the answer is just overwhelmingly no. It's not plausible at all mathematically. And on the flip side, um, 
We do know, however, of a cause that is sufficient to produce new information. This is why it's not a god of the gaps or an argument from ignorance, is we're, we're drawing, and this is Darwin's historical scientific method. When you're trying to explain an event in the remote past, you want to draw on your knowledge of cause and effect. What kind of cause is out there that we've observed that is capable of producing the effect in question? And if the effect is a lot of new digital information, we know of a cause that can do that, and it's a mind or an intelligence. And it, ha it happens that that's the only known cause that can produce lots of new information. And it's certainly much more plausible than the Darwinian idea of a random search. And we show why mathematically it's much more plausible. Now, one, one of the theories about the, the idea that, that randomness is still in the system is Stephen Jay Gould's idea of punctuated equilibrium, that, right. that essentially small groups of animals kind of went away from the big group, they, they did all their changes, and then they reintegrated. Why, why doesn't that work, the idea that the, the, the jumps in the fossil record are a result of small groups breaking away in a certain level of group selection? Yeah, Gr um, Gould's model was a terrific advance as far as its accuracy in describing the fossil record, because he described these big punctuations or big jumps, and then the long-term stasis that would occur, lack of directional evolutionary change. That's what we see in the fossil record, very non-Darwinian. The problem was he didn't really have a mechanism that could uh, accomplish the, 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 that could produce the amount of change that we're seeing. I, I discussed it as a whole chat. I do a whole chapter on this in Darwin's Doubt. But the mechanism he proposed was called species selection. A lot of other evolutionary biologists, including Richard Dawkins, were very critical of the mechanism. And in a way, rightly so, because it, what it came down to in the end was that species selection itself depended on the natural selection random mutation mechanism. And that mechanism requires lots of time to get the job done. Um, and it turns out four billion years isn't enough, but it, certainly the, the abrupt jumps that Gould was talking about were not allowing the mechanism enough time to, to work. So he had this, this kind of um, irony in evolutionary biology in the 80s and 90s in particular. Gould's model pretty much was dismissed by the early 2000s, but you had Gould's model was uh, viewed as um, a good one for describing the fossil record accurately, but it didn't have a mechanism. The Darwinians had a mechanism, but it was inconsistent with the fossil record. And also, then, as we've later critiqued, the mechanism was also lacked the creative power to generate the information necessary to build big new, you know, major innovations in the history of life. So from a design perspective, what exactly is the theory of how one species would become another suddenly? Is it that there is a bunch of dead DNA that is suddenly oh. activated? Or is it that yeah, right. something injects new information into the system? How exactly would that work? What's well, the mechanism? The, the, the question of species raises this whole question of envelopes of variability. We see evidence of design at the, 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 the loci of the design are when you get the major innovations occurring in the history of life. But the information that is present in uh, a major group of organisms might be sufficient to allow a lot of variation within, a, within an envelope. So that's why there, there is evolution. We think there is there's clearly evolution that takes place. The question is how, how much information was present and how, uh, how wide the envelopes of variability are that are generated by that information. So there's a, a terrific evolutionary biologist and cell biologist, biologist at the University of Chicago, also named Shapiro, James Shapiro, who's got a new theory of evolution he calls um, uh, natural genetic engineering. And he notices that, and has documented, that, that many of the mutations that we actually see at work are not random at all. They're, they're um, an expression of what he calls pre-programmed adaptive capacity, where there's a, a, an external trigger or stress put on an organism, and that triggers the, pr the production of certain proteins that were, for which the organism had the capability of building all along because it had the genetic information there. And so a lot of the evolution we see is actually uh, pre-programmed adaptive capacity, which is really a, an exciting biological phenomenon that the Darwinians haven't really taken full account of, but it does raise the question of the origin of that adaptive capacity, where the pre-programming come from. So intelligent design, says the, the inputs of information from outside the system, from an intelligence, are located in that pre-programmed adaptive capacity, but it, the theory also acknowledges that the, there is evolution possible going downstream as a result of that pre-existing information.